the bottom line because Stone Cold I have a lot of things I want to get off my chest. This is The Pencil, a professional wrestling podcast starring Rennie D and friends. Thanks for listening to The Pencil. Subscribe to the show on iTunes and follow us on Twitter at Pencil Podcast. Hey, hey, and welcome to episode 18 of The Pencil, the professional wrestling podcast. I am Travis Mester, sitting here in live in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, tonight with Rennie D. How are you doing, Rennie D? We're here to talk to you. I'm fantastic, and that was well, man. That was good. Your first time introducing the show. Normally, it's me from a distance. Normally, I'm from the the, the two-bedroom condo apartment overlooking Lake Michigan, but we are. We're here in Cottage Grove. We're at your pad. We got a Christmas tree. The fireplace is lit. We got a fish tank. We got raw on repeat. We got dirt. We got queen live in studio. Uh, it's just fantastic um, you know, to be here in person with you, my friend. And, and we have a lot to talk about given what we saw last night, not only on Monday Night Raw, but the Vince McMahon podcast, but what everybody is talking about. Seems like it's CM Punk. So we have a list of things that we want to cover in a short amount of time. It really is up to you, man. Where do you want to start tonight? Should we start in chronological order and should we start with the Punk Podcast and then go from there? Or how would you want to do this, man? I I think we go with the Punk Podcast first and then go forward because I think each of us have done a good job and we've done it on purpose. We've talked about professional wrestling on this podcast. We've talked about WWE. We've talked about what's going on currently. We have not brought up CM Punk very much at all. And there's a reason for that. That's not that's we we didn't sit down and make a design to not do it on purpose, but if he's not on TV and he's not in the storylines and he's not around, he's not part of this show. There's no reason to talk about somebody who's not contributing to the product today because we want to tell you about the product today and what's going on in the world of wrestling. Obviously, I've voiced my opinion about how I feel about the fans chanting CM Punk during matches on a card. You listened to the podcast, it was about a two hour podcast on Cole Cabana's Utter Wrestling, which is a fantastic podcast. If you haven't listened to it, you're crazy, first off. Uh, if you're a wrestling fan, obviously you want to hear what Punk has to say. But I want, I, want, I want to do this first on the Punk Podcast. Let's do this. A couple sentences from you, Rennie D. When you listened to it, it was an hour and 50 minutes on the Art of Pro Wrestling, Cole Cabana's, Cole Cabana's podcast. It was fantastic. A couple sentences. What did you take from it? Is there anything that stuck out? Is there anything that you thought... You didn't realize, you didn't think this happened, yada, yada, yada. What, what, what was your takeaway? I would say three things I'm going to take away. I'll try to keep it to three. One is how Punk initially said it wasn't about the money, but the money became a theme. It really seemed like, given his payoff on some things. Uh, two, the fact that he said this wasn't a shoot on WWE, and he has no, you know, it's not anti-WWE, but it really came off as anti-WWE to me. Uh, and three... If it's true, because this is only one side of the story, the, I guess, mistreatment of the WWE doctors towards his injuries is shocking to me in a professional organization. Those are my, my big three takeaways from the podcast uh, you know, on Cole Cabana, I guess. And that's from a, a wrestler's perspective, um, being involved in the business of wrestling. I have a lot of thoughts on the punk podcast, which we're going to get into. But what were your main takeaways you know, from the podcast, too, from just a casual fan perspective? And obviously, you've, you've been watching since Punk's been hot in WWE, and you've been around. I mean, we were going to WrestleMania, my, man. We wanted to see Punk, and he walked out in January. My, my takeaway was one-fold, and it was this guy head, headlining WrestleMania, and if he was the top-paid guy in the company – isn't going to change anything with this guy, I don't think. I, I don't think he likes professional wrestling. I don't think he likes sports entertainment. He, he did at one point, the CM Punk of 2014 that we listened to on Tuesday, it doesn't matter what you give him and if he was the main event of WrestleMania in 2012, 2013, and this past year when we were there at WrestleMania 30. It wouldn't matter. He's coming up with a reason that he's telling Cole Cabana now on his podcast, and I don't think the reason is legit. I think... 
that's the easiest reason for him to use right now. I don't think he likes it, and he doesn't need to have one. I don't care why he's gone, but I feel like the reasons that he gave, if all those were corrected, I still think he's the same guy. And I think The Rock, in a promo before Royal Rumble 2013, that, I believe. 2000, yeah, that, I think that's yeah, because he worked The Rock. When he worked Rumble, The right? Rock, if, if you remember The Rock's promo... Before Royal Rumble, I think it was probably like the second week in January of 2013, he looked Punk in the ring, he looked him in the face and said, you're one of the brightest minds in the history of this business, and you're one of the greatest in the ring that anybody's ever seen, but as soon as you got that, and he pointed at the WWE Championship, you became the biggest jackass in the industry. And that's who I heard on Tuesday night. It's just tough from my perspective... The end-all, be-all goal for me was to make it to WWE. And obviously, I, I did my thing. I, I didn't get a job. And I can easily sit here and say, well, I can't believe he took his ball and went home. Like, there's a million of us guys out there that want that spotlight, that want that opportunity. And the WWE made him so much money. And, and he, he alluded to the fact that WD, WWE didn't make me, motherfucker. You know, like, I made myself. And, and, he, the, and, the, and this, this is in no way anti-punk because – Whenever I just brought up that rock promo that he was the biggest jackass ever, I'm sitting here at a table in Cottage Grove, Minnesota with two of the biggest jackasses I know. There's nothing wrong with being a jackass, but the way that he went about it could have done better. I don't think he cares if it was done better because he 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 he, he goes by the beat of his own drum, and that's to be respected, but... That's also going to put and him in a we're, situation. We're going to wrap this into the Vince's podcast with Stone Cold after Raw. If you're looking at these, you listen to both these podcasts. Now, obviously, Punk's main thing in his podcast was to talk about the WWE. Vince, his main thing wasn't to talk about Punk. But Vince looked better, I thought, than Punk walking away from the podcast. Punk looked like a bitter man who didn't get what he wanted Made a lot of money, who still was, wanted more money. Who is holding on to the fact that, well, it was his idea and Triple H got to do it. And then it was his idea and Brock Lesnar got to do it and then Punk didn't. Get, I mean, everyone in the that's listening to this has a job. There's people in the job that get things that you don't. And Punk happened to draw the short straw. He obviously is not okay with it and he's not going to stand for it. But that's the that's the nature of the business in any business. And he's working in a business that's... Much bigger and the beast, no pun intended for Brock Lesnar, I suppose, of the business is that he's got to deal with that. And I will tell you, as a pro wrestler, I've dealt with injuries, and they suck, man. I can't imagine what it would be like wrestling 300 days a year on injuries. I wrestled for weekends. I wrestled a Saturday, uh, you know, a Friday, Saturday, maybe twice, maybe three, four times a weekend. Punk's out there wrestling 300 days a year. I get it. Injuries, you get no sleep. I, I know, you know, obviously talking with people in the business now, you don't get a lot of sleep. So it, I can't speak for him. If his injuries were neglected, like he said that they actually were, that's bullshit. That's utter bullshit because you need to address that. But it also says how important CM Punk was to the WWE product. I mean, he said, I didn't get the main event, WrestleMania. I didn't feel like I was a big time star. You had surgery on your elbow. And as you're walking out of ER, Vince calls you and says, are you ready for TV on Monday? That means Vince has faith in you and Vince needs you and wants you. And I get it. You didn't want to be there. And that's that's one thing. And yes, you didn't need to wrestle. Book it, motherfucker. You didn't need to wrestle. And he didn't. But Vince obviously loved punk. It sounded last night on Vince's podcast with Stone Cold that he still appreciates what punk did for the business. He obviously apologized for the divorce or not the divorce, but for the the. Uh, the severance papers on his wedding day, whether that was calculated or not, I don't know. All I know, Punk has his reasons. He doesn't need to be in WWE. WWE didn't even need to address it last night. Like Vince could have said, no, I don't want to talk about it, and they still have been fine. They don't need CM Punk. CM Punk doesn't need the WWE. He said his piece. Vince addressed it like a professional, said the door is wide open. Vince apologized, which shocked me. I didn't think that was going to happen. I still do not think... We will ever, and this is hard for me to say because I never thought we'd see Bret Hart. I never I thought agree. we'd see Hogan. But I, I just, I don't think we'll see Philip Brooks in WWE ever again. You think he's going to get into the Hall of Fame? If they offer him to the Hall of Fame, he's not going to show up. So, I mean, the only way he would go into the Hall of Fame is if he agrees to go into the Hall of Fame. 
And but at the end of the day, nobody thought Warrior would go in the Hall of Fame. Nobody thought Brett would. Nobody thought Hogan would. These guys all. Nobody thought Bruno would go in the Hall of Fame until Triple H talked to him. We'll, well see episode episode nine hundred and fifty of the pencil. Hopefully, we're talking about CM Punk going into the Hall of Fame, but we'll see. And it was really interesting last night in Vince's podcast when Stone Cold's like, "Well, I took my ball and went home," but I had a JR to talk to, and Punk doesn't have communication skills according to the podcast, and he doesn't have somebody he can talk to to bridge that gap between him and Vince. But I watched an interview before Punk walked out where he said him and Vince are good friends. They're both insomniacs. They text each other in the middle of the night. I would think that they'd be able to work something out in the future, especially when it comes to the amount of money that they would potentially pay to have him there. I don't think he ever wrestles a match again. No, 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 no. He'll never be in a ring in tights again, but I, I just I get the feeling that at some point you're gonna, we're going to see him on WWE television again, but I don't think we're ever seeing a GTS again in the ring. And it's tough, too, because you think about, well, I lawyered up, and we, we're going to go get those motherfuckers, right? He said that verbatim. We're going to get those motherfuckers. Like, everything that he said, he came off so fucking bitter. And then I get, like, you're mad the way things ended. They, they fired you on your wedding day. But they did. At the end of the day, Dirt, they made him a ton of fucking money. Devil's advocate, he made him. A bunch of money. Well, yeah, he's a workhorse. <laughs> okay, that, I mean, that's not being a devil's advocate. That's true. He worked his ass off, and he was mad about turning heel because you sell less merchandise. He was out selling John Cena. How many times did I have to hear that on the, on the Cole Cabana podcast? But here, yeah, here's the thing, too. You take, you take CM Punk's best six months of merchandise sales, his best, when he was out selling John Cena. Then you take John Cena's best six months. John Cena's gotten blown out of the water easily. And it's just, it's, it was just frustrating. I mean, I enjoyed listening to the podcast. I just really think that he walked out in January. He did the podcast in November. That gave him 10 months. He might need three, four years like Jericho did or like you know Stone Cold needed eight months. But He's like, only 36. Give him eight years. He can come back and start a streak or something at WrestleMania. You know, I mean, it, it, a couple things, too, that stood out to me before we move on to the next subject is the disrespect it seemed like he had for The Undertaker. And it just seemed like he wasn't satisfied with working Taker, which the streak at WrestleMania was bigger than any main event. It didn't sound like he was satisfied with potentially working Triple H either. I don't think he made any. What points was about what that. was the what was the exact quote he said? I will not give him the fucking privilege. The of privilege wrestling, to of wrestling him. Triple H has drawn more money, man, than you have ever drawn, Phil. Like it's just. It, I get it. It's a part-time status. You work The Rock. You said, okay, I'm glad. I'll work The Rock. But then you won't work Triple H at WrestleMania because it's not the main event. That would have been a great match. I don't know. Like I'm torn. I, don't, I can't speak for him. Like I'm upset by some of the things he said, but I also sympathize with him for some of the things that he I'm said talking, as well. I think anybody that talks about that or anybody that listened to it at some point in their description of it is going to be talking out of both sides of their mouth. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It makes you open-minded. It means you understand both both sides, but there's strong opinions on both sides. There's no doubt. But enough about Punk. Enough about Vince. Love the podcast. Love both of them. Stone Cold did a fantastic job of interviewing. But what's happening in the, in the real deal, WWE today, Raw this past week. And here, here we're going we're gonna to blow your mind, people, because I cannot believe the social media presence on Twitter, because I do follow it pretty religiously on our, our Pencil Podcast account. People Dirt were so upset with Raw. They said it was one of the most boring Raws in the history of Raw and how garbage it was. You, you have heard me on this podcast for the past month talk about the garbage Raws. Two of the last three weeks I thought were two of the worst Raws of the year. And of anybody that's going to throw it under the bus, I mean, I'm, I needed to be convinced. I, I needed to be talked into loving this episode. And... I, I read on the internet today. I saw a lot of people talking that people didn't like it. I thought it what was, did you guys like? I thought what it was, the I fuck thought did it was, you like? I thought it was a great episode of Raw. It was compelling for two and a half of the three hours, and I've got the segment sitting in front of me, and I don't know what, what I don't know what segment didn't further some some angle. So Here, I, I here's what we did. for those of you listening. Travis and I watched the show together last night, and uh, today I sat down. I wrote down segments one through whatever it was one through twelve. Twelve different segments, which include matches. Every segment, I believe, for the most part, sold something for the future. Whether it be a match at TLC, whether it be a uh, I guess an angle with a certain character. I mean, we don't. There's not necessarily not every match or every segment sold a match for TLC because not all the matches are settled yet. But I mean, we literally can go through it. The opening segment was 22 minutes long, right? 22 minutes long, and we had four things that came out of that. Johnson and Seth Rollins at TLC with the stipulation. That's two things right there. We had two matches for the night. The main event, 
Eric Rowan Big Show. In 22 minutes, generally I'm going to complain about 22 minutes of talk and no wrestling. There's been three hours of Raw in the past month. There's been episodes of Raw where I've complained that there haven't been three or four segments that have even kept me interested. The first 22 minutes, I will admit, the openings of Raw have gotten annoying with how long they are and it's all talking mostly. But they furthered three feuds, three storylines in 22 minutes. And I was sitting there thinking... This is already better than most. And then they bring out the tag team turmoil match. And you and I have been asking for this kind of stuff for weeks about the U.S. title, about the Intercontinental title, about the tag team Shout out to Lee Stork for the drinks. Appreciate that. Shout out to Lee Lee Stork bringing us over drinks. We got our own personal bartender tonight. It's fantastic. Live live in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. I'm not going to give you my address, but if anybody needs to find me, at Travis Messer on Twitter. But I digress. Tag team championship turmoil match. What did you think of that? It was fantastic. It was fantastic. They, they when was the last time they done a match like that? The last thing I can remember is whenever they did the beat the clock uh, to see who was going to be the number one. Contender. Right, like a gimmick match, which yep. is different. It's not your typical no disqualification, false coming or bullshit. Like that's there all was... they need to do. That's all they need to do to make thirty, forty more minutes of Raw uh, interesting instead of having oh god backstage stuff on this or backstage or stuff guest on host that or, or guest whatever. Host, it is. But yeah. here, the thing in this match too, what they did is they they were able to work with two separate angles: the New Day and the Dust Brothers. Not for the titles, the Usos and Miz and Mizdell, which also coupled into the Naomi segment backstage. As much as you hate the Bunny and Adam Rose, they also got a little bit of play. And you didn't have to see them in a two-on-two match or a one-on-one match for seven minutes in the nine o'clock hour. You got to get it out of the way in a match that actually had other things going on. I thought that was the best tag team stuff that we've seen, and I've been well documented with how much I do not enjoy the tag team most of the time. The tag team... uh, matches on Raw or SmackDown, but what, that, what, was, that was some of the best stuff I've seen. What about the New Day, man? What do you think of the New Day stable? I you wrote the article on PencilPodcast.com. You said, I want more stables. I want more factions in the WWE. We have one. Two, I, I was sitting watching SmackDown recorded. I was watching it on Friday night. I did not know that they uh, debuted on SmackDown until I saw the commercial saying, New Day, coming up next, debuting. And I rolled my eyes and thought, they're debuting on SmackDown? Fucking great. This is going to be a goddamn joke. They came out for about a minute and a half. I thought I was right. I thought it was a fucking joke. And I was laughing at it, thinking, God, these guys have to just put these smiles on. But and by the end of that match... I, I, I was wrong, and I was into it. I thought it was cool. I thought the music was great. I think they've got something they can grab onto. I thought the same thing on Raw, and I love, love, love the fact that they didn't go over on Raw. Because right now, what's the hottest thing that we've been talking about for four weeks? Miz Dow, Damian Miz Dow and, and the Miz, tag team champions. You do not put the New Day against them because who's going to steal the show? Miz Dow. Because the New, New Day, Day is not the, hot The New Day didn't yet. need it, right? They had the vignettes. They didn't exactly. need that push. They have... The Dust Brothers. And, yeah. and, and we know that Gold Dust will put over anybody, Goldies. anytime. And Goldie's going to work his ass off. Dustin's fantastic. He's going to work his ass off. And I'm, I'm a huge fan. Huge fucking fan of their finish. I think their finish is fantastic. They, they look finish. like a tag team. They've got, they look the same. They dress the same. They've got Boom. they've got moves that actually make them look like a tag team. It's it's great. It's fantastic. I'm very content with what they've done the first two two times being on TV. We'll see what they do in the next three Before weeks. we move on to the next part, what do you think about the fact that they you know, kind of play paper, rock, scissors, or whatever it is, to decide who the tag team is? Do you think they should continue to do that, or do you think it should be Xavier Woods and Kofi as a tag team and Big E by himself or something I thought, else? I thought it was going to be Kofi and Big E all along. I thought Xavier Woods kind of came off as like the mouthpiece of the group, but... I like what they're, but my idea was that I like what they did last night even better. So Monday Night Raw's rock paper scissors. I think that's the way they should decide there. Obviously, we know they're not actually deciding it that way, but in front of the audience, I like that. And I think the the, the Usos and Miz Dow and Miz at, at TLC is gonna be good. It's gonna be a fantastic match. The Naomi segment backstage, different. I mean, we haven't seen that type of thing since the Daniel Bryan AJ Lee thing, or even maybe a uh, uh, Zach Ryder and Eva. Or not Eva, whatever the hell her name was that she's no longer with the company. Oh, anymore, Eva, you know, Eva, where what, she kissed what, John Cena. Yeah, what that the hell's thing, her yeah. name? Uh, the I should her? know her. Gracie's <laughs> her husband. Whatever, whatever it is. Um, and now, you know, obviously, it's just Eve. Eve, Eve. yes, <laughs> Eve Torres. Eve yeah. Torres. Okay, Eve Torres. Big Show. Eric Rowan. Eric Rowan's promo backstage what, might have been the only dumb thing on the show, to be honest with you. And I'm a fan of Eric because I'm biased as fuck. Explain the whole Rubik Cube thing with him having an you know, IQ of 147 or, or whatever they said. I think they need to limit his words, which they're doing good at. 
Uh, they have a nickname for him now, Big Red Rowan. I don't know how I feel about that, but hey. Sounds like what I would be called if I was in the WWE. Big Red Rowan, yeah. So, Big I mean, Red Brad, Big Red Brad. I like that their match ended the way it did. It sets up for some sort of match at TLC. They really, the, the, the stairs last night were the gimmick from beginning to end. And Eric got busted open pretty good. The stairs legitimately fell on the side of his head and slid them open pretty good. If you go on Vine or on Instagram, you can see the video footage of it. It's kind of disgusting. And he sells it like he's, he's, he's going crazy. Uh, next segment, Vince arriving in the limo. What was the point of that? Putting over the network, baby. Putting over the network. And for the record, I know we weren't gonna, we're not going to talk much about this, but that is what they need to do more in the network. They need to have more things like this because I guarantee it was the number one trend in the world last night in Twitter. Is there any doubt in your mind that in the last 24 hours, Chris Jericho has been either on the phone or in somebody's office asking to have the Jericho podcast I bet you'll have on Jericho there. on there. They better. They better. That shit is unbelievable. I'm going to log on after Raw to watch that over anything else. They the Raw be- backstage is stupid. If we have these podcasts with compelling superstars, because we're in the reality era, they say. So give us uh, – Bray Wyatt was just on Stone Cold's podcast. Why not have that shit on the network? But, I mean, that's what they need to do. And I think they're going to realize moving forward that the amount of traction they got on social media. And I bet you that – I literally think that was the most watched thing on the network since WrestleMania. And it, probably even more because the numbers are higher now. So I don't know. Um, Fandango, Jack Swagger, no match. Nothing for Fandango, but it really set up Jack Swagger and Rusev moving forward. Rusev attacked. Zeb Kotler backstage. Good. When was the last time we saw something like that? When was yeah. the last time you saw any guy get attacked backstage? When was the last time that you saw music hit and somebody doesn't show up? It's exactly. Too, there's too many things that happen nonchalantly and they just continue to happen for no reason. And one of them is your music hits, you come out. Your music hits, you come out. It's just good to see something different. And I didn't have any problem with it. Yes, Swagger and Rusev had their feud in the past when they had it. You and I both thought that it might have had, had a couple extra legs to it to maybe have another, yep. another couple matches, maybe one more pay-per-view. If they're correcting themselves at this point with that one, with one more match at TLC, I don't have anything against that. So and not to mention that Swagger was in Oklahoma last night. It was in Tulsa. So we're looking at the the college that he wrestled for and was an all American. Well, they're in, they're in his college campus tonight for SmackDown. Yes. So, so tonight is going to so tonight's tapings for Friday SmackDown no no doubt are going to be pushed with that that in mind. I would have a seat feeling because last night was Tulsa Oklahoma. Tonight they'll be in Norman, right? Right. And I think I want to go back to something that you mentioned real quick earlier. How I can't believe the New Day debuted on fucking SmackDown. You know, like it's SmackDown, right? But SmackDown moves to Thursdays in in three weeks or four weeks or whatever it is. I think they need to start developing it as a show, you know, a better show. Correct. And, and I shouldn't I, think I shouldn't a, say it like that. I shouldn't say they debuted on SmackDown as if it's detrimental to their careers because SmackDown should matter. It just hasn't mattered for so long that they make me feel like that's my attitude towards it. So when, okay. whenever I'll, I'll change my opinion because even this wor- SmackDown was was. Thirty-five percent replay from Raw. Correct. Even even this past week SmackDown, which was a step forward from other ones. So I will change my opinion on SmackDown when the world around me changes. Missed out I, th- for I think Daniel Tosh actually said that in one of his comedy <laughs> things I saw live like a year ago. He will change his opinions on people around him when they change. So I will change my opinion on SmackDown when it changes. And, and segment eight, and we don't have much more. I mean, segment eight was Miz down Fernando. Uh, I mean, it, it didn't. The match itself was meaningless. Right? I mean, Fernando's part of a tag team. I can see how that plays into the story. But Jimmy Uso coming out and slapping Miz, which was awesome, uh, plays into that more. And then we had Bray Wyatt versus R-Truth. Obviously a squash match. But again, after the match, what did we see? We saw Dean Ambrose come out, tables, ladders, and chairs. And actually, I saw on Twitter and everywhere else that I read that smashing of Bray Wyatt's rocking chair was really stupid. Symbol is what makes it stupid. CM Punk picked up the urn and poured the ashes all over the Undertaker before Royal Rumble, and everybody thought it was crazy. How dare you do that? You need to give Bray Wyatt's character some sort of depth. That's what they're trying to do with this chair. The chair is going to have some sort of significance. Where do you get the chair from? Was it from Abigail or whatever it is that makes him so weird? And I it's scripted. How can you guys talk about a a, a chair? Well, because if you don't know it's scripted, then stop listening to the podcast and stop watching wrestling. Exactly. Jesus Christ. (laughs) So symbolism with the chair. I we're going to touch on Raw. We have Raw going. You know, go home show coming up next week. Segment eleven was potentially the best segment. Actually, let's go back to segment ten. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. AJ Lee and Naomi versus the Bellas. The only part about that segment that you and I, I think, are both frustrated about is the fact that we don't know why 
they have not addressed Bree and Nikki apparently just getting along after 31 days of, of being an assistant. That was the biggest negative of Raw. I thought Raw was entirely good. And I didn't even hate this segment, to be honest. I thought it was nice to see AJ tap out the Divas champion. It was nice to see her actually use her submission move again. But you're right. I, I just need some sort of explanation. I don't care if it's a bad one. Something would be nice. Just give us... Like her, She should be done being her... Her assistant. Thir- her assistant for 30 But days. we saw that after the match, we saw a little dysfunction between them two. But they need to fucking tell us something Nick, because it Nikki, makes no sense to have the dysfunction yeah, now. Yeah, Nick, Nikki is still treating her as an assistant. So is Brie going to now all of a sudden turn and have fucking Brie mode on her sister? Because that would make Brie and Nikki it, Royal would, Rumble is where we're going, yeah, right? That, That's that would exactly make about as much sense as what's happened in the last two weeks. What about segment 11? I think this is my favorite segment of the night, and I would, uh, would guess it was yours with Paul Heyman. Loved it. By him not being there and addressing – he addressed three very important topics. One was the fact that Lesnar is a special attraction. He does not need to be there. He also addressed if John Cena loses at TLC, who is the number one contender? Make it the whole locker room. He'll destroy them all. I loved, I loved how he just buried everybody. It was great. But the third thing he mentioned was something that you and I have been, I guess, loathing for. for. Loathing for. This is what we wanted. Seth Rollins curb stomping Lesnar, and the apology has now been. Uh, I guess he said he takes it back, right? He's taking back that apology. So it was good they finally addressed it, and I can imagine that they're going to use one of Brock Lesnar's dates at TLC. Uh, you, if you, not, you, it's the Raw after. But I would like to see him come out at TLC at well, five. Well, both Rollins and F five. He's going to be at the Slammies next week. No, they took his date off. They're not going to. They be there. Okay. What before we hop into the main event, which in itself was awesome? What if John Cena loses at TLC? I mean, we're gonna start hearing some fucking voices. I think is that is that the logical th- next step for Randy, the WWE? I think Randy Orton goes to goes into the number one contendership. I don't know if that means he loses at TLC, which we will talk about this more obviously next week after the go home show, and we'll make our predictions. But as of right now, I think one of the most interesting things is. If you're having Brock Lesnar come out the night after TLC, does it not make some sort of sense to have John Cena lose at TLC, have there be no number one contender, and then have a four-week tournament leading up to Royal Rumble? If John Cena does not win and he play, and he wrestles at TLC or, or, or loses at TLC, then he will be in the Royal Rumble. Correct. So by him winning the match, Which he will, will not compete in the Rumble. By him, by him losing the match, he will be in the Rumble. Then he'll by, get him being, by, Rusev. by him being in the, in the Royal Rumble, it will keep him and Rusev from either of them having to win the Royal Rumble because they will knock each other out, starting a feud with each other, leading to WrestleMania. It makes too much sense in too many different storylines, I think. But then who you, – so you're saying Randy Orton's I'm not saying, in the Rumble. He, he'll wrestle Lesnar at Royal at Rumble. At Royal Rumble. I'm saying a four-week tournament that John Cena is not allowed to be a part of. So we'll have Sheamus, we'll have Orton, we'll have Big Which would be Show. compelling. That would be compelling to Yeah, me. a four-week tournament. Because uh, then not just send you a message like two weeks ago saying WrestleMania 4 when Macho Man won like the World Heavyweight title through a tournament. I thought that he should bring something like that back. Yes, it would be, fan- it'd be fantastic. And all you need to do is have Lesnar on for one week. He'll be on the night after saying, who's going to try to challenge me? Have a couple guys come out to the ring. Lesnar clear him out. He walks out. You don't see him till the Rumble. And the, whoever came out to the ring on that Monday. This is all. This is all. This is all smoke and mirrors. If 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 Cena ends up going over on Rollins, but these are just ideas. One question we had on Twitter, real quick: WrestleMania 31, who walks out? The WWE World Heavyweight Champion. As much as I don't want to say it, I agree with David last week. I do. I think Roman Reigns walks out the champion, and it's fucking horse shit. Just because he's not ready for it. I just don't know who else walks out as champion. I um, don't know who walks out champion. From I, To be honest with you, if Lesnar's not going to re-sign with the WWE, I have him drop the title before Mania and build a better program for the main event, but they so won't one, do it. one name, who walks out 31 champion? Roman Reigns. I got Brock Lesnar. All right. And so let's uh, – segment 12, main event. 
they when the main event went on last night, it was nine twenty five Central Time, right? Was that was that was, about twelve twelve minutes of entrances, which was needed because God, if they would have given him forty minutes, we would have had many rest. The only downfall in that match was going to commercial break while Ryback was giving a suplex. Yeah, I thought somebody died. I thought it was a mistake on the TV. I thought he might have dropped Eric Rowan or excuse me, Luke Harper directly on his head. But which that would ma- have been which would have been great after what Punk said it said on the on the podcast or on Colt Cabana's podcast. But he didn't. Are you are you are you trying? to hurt me on purpose or you're just completely fucking stupid <laughs> but, but I mean, i'm not, just fucking dumb yeah i'm just fucking dumb but so this match the main event everything in the main event contributed to four matches at tlc eric rowan and big show john cena and seth rollins kane and ryback and it hasn't been confirmed yet but it will be probably on, i would think on smackdown this week dolph ziggler and uh what the fuck brody brody harper luke harper yes and probably a ladder match for the Intercontinental title. Correct. And and what do people complain about on the internet? What do people complain about watching wrestling whenever they have Hell in a Cell, when they have TLC, when they have Extreme Rules, that they don't have enough matches following the, the structure of that pay-per-view? We are being given a pay-per-view, TLC, that we already know for sure has four matches that are going to be having to do with TLC. And David Hero from Pro Wrestling Report said it was a throwaway pay-per-view. I'm more interested I'm in this more pay-per-view right in now than I was Survivor Series before that stipulation got added. Correct, correct. And Survivor Series ended up very good because it had a good ending and the ending saves it all. But which, I mean, you tell me, is it more 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 exciting with these four matches plus a tag team championship match? So we've got five matches right now, I believe, that are on the card. And a Divas match, so we've got six already. They did a better job building this pay-per-view in three hours than they did in five weeks. For the oh, last absolutely. Week. I mean, Survivor Series obviously was built for the main event, main event only. People complain there's not enough wrestling on TV. Seven of the 12 segments last night were wrestling. And if we want to get time-wise, a lot of it was obviously wrestling. Some of the – besides the opening segment, every other segment was pretty pretty light. So, I mean, it's going to be cool. We got, we got SmackDown on Friday. We got the Go Home Show on Monday. We got Rennie versus Dirty Picks again, which – Jesus fucking Christ. I mean, I need to get one more right because I can't – I mean, I can afford it. I just don't want to buy you another bottle of brandy. I don't want to fucking do it. Not one bit. I'll, I could put a bender on if I have to. Bender. By the way, every, everybody in, in Minneapolis-St. Paul, plan on seeing the pencil at the December 22nd Monday Night Raw uh, uh, taping here in Minneapolis. I'm going to plan on being in the area, going with dirt, going with some of our friends. Probably going to be hanging out. So, uh, and we're going to do more than likely we're going to do a live podcast. So just keep that in mind. Next week we have Dysfunction, aka the Weed Man. Yes, you heard that right. The Weed Man from Juggalo Championship Wrestling. He has a benefit event coming up the following weekend for Silas Young, Ring of Honor superstar for breaking his leg. Just also keep in mind we got Justin Labar from the from Wrestle Zone, former writer for Bleacher Report, also writes for the Pittsburgh Tribune. Uh, we have a referee, Rob Page, coming up, and then our, you know, we have two biggie, uh, big stars, Lance Archer from New Japan Pro Wrestling. They're having their big January fourth Wrestle Kingdom show. He's coming on the show at the end of the month, and then Mr. Ken Anderson, who, by the way, we're going to allude to this on the Mick Karch portion of it. Some of the stuff that he did with Undertaker was pretty cool. So I, it's going to be fun to talk to, with him about that, about how his time was cut short in WWE. Parting thoughts, Dirt. I mean, this is, we're live. This is the second time we've ever been live in the same location. Parting thoughts for the podcast, for the fan base. I got my fingers crossed that uh, that our interviewee tonight, who was fantastic, Mick Karch, doesn't come to you with some sort of offer that ends the pencil the way that we know it after just 18 episodes because it's been 18 fantastic episodes so far and I'm, I'm looking to get into the road to Wrestlemania. Just don't, wait let, till, don't let him steal you away. Don't we gotta let him wait, steal we you gotta away. we got to wait until episode like 900 until Punk accepts his Hall of Fame introduction be- or induction before anything else. But Yeah, we're going to have to push these to two-hour episodes whenever we get to the Royal Rumble, I think. Speaking of the Royal Rumble, before I go, I mean, check. we're going to have a simulcast coming up with another podcast. It's the first of its kind. So do us a favor. Here is how you support this podcast. You go to iTunes. You subscribe to the thing. It automatically downloads to your iPhone or iPad. You rate, and then you review it for us as well. Then you share it with a friend via social media, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, what else is out there for social media? Uh, if, you, if you share it with friends and they're like a girlfriend or like a girl that's just one of your friends, just shoot them to at TravisMester.com. Have them send me a, a private message. 
PM them. I mean, we're on YouTube. If you don't have an, uh, an Apple device, we're on YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. But really, the best way to support us is we don't want you to go to some fucking Amazon link. We don't need you to give us money. We're fine there. We just need you to listen to the show. We need you to enjoy the show. And if you have feedback, let us know so we can make it better for you. We're at Pencil Podcast on Twitter. PencilPodcast.com is our website. We're on Facebook under The Pencil. Uh, Travis is on Twitter at Pencil. Sorry, he's at, at Travis Mester. I'm at Real Renny D. Check us out every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. Next week, we come at you with Dysfunction, a.k.a. The Weed Man. Check out Pencil Podcast for more updates. See ya. See ya, Drapes. You've been listening to another great episode of The Pencil, a professional wrestling podcast coming straight at you every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. But hang around. We got a lot more to come because up next is the guest of the evening. We dive right into the world of professional wrestling, asking all the questions that you want answers to. Up next. Hey, this is Chris Jericho. You're listening to The Pencil with Renny D. Pencil, baby! He's a pencil! Yeah, boy! The Pencil's kicking off the new year with their biggest podcast yet. On January 6th, we will officially kick off Destination Impact. We are available on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. Find us online at PencilPodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at PencilPodcast as we welcome former TNA World Heavyweight Champion, Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great matches on the card in Eau Claire, Wisconsin tonight pits Big Mitch Paradise, 275 pounds out of Paradise City, against a man who has absolutely taken off in the world of professional wrestling. Goes back a long, long time, ladies and gentlemen. Where, where is the man? He's not. Oh, you you haven't lost a beat, have you, pal, oh. in the last 10 years? Mr. Anderson, what a Ken Anderson. Sight for sore eyes. Mick Karch, you know what? We go back a long way. We do. We do. And, uh, you know, you were kind of one of my biggest supporters, one of my biggest fans. You know, you know how I know this? How do you know that? Because you, this man right here, is one giant asshole. <laughs> I mean, Ken Anderson might think this guy is an asshole, and, and sometimes maybe I thought he was an asshole too, but in the best way possible. I'm just totally kidding. We got the voice of AWA on the line with us right now. Mick Karch, how is it going, my friend? It's been a while since we've talked. It has been a while, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, the, the voice of the AWA, what's, what's really funny about that, Ryan, is that I was uh, doing TV for Vern for all of about four months. And, you know, so, but, but so many people say, oh yeah, you were the voice of the AWA. But in, you know, in reality, it was just kind of a blip on the radar as far as the announcing is concerned. But, uh, you know, Hey, I'll take it. Anything looks good on the resume and, uh, we're good to go. Well, at least the voice of Minnesota professional wrestling. I mean, you've, you've come to be known as that across the state, especially with some of the young guys like myself and some of the guys who've been here forever, but let's start. Let's uh, and I know you've been on many podcasts before. Some with Wade Keller, some with other other friends and and whatnot in the business. How did you get involved in pro wrestling? I read some stories online, but I want to hear it from the lion's mouth. How did you get involved in the greatest sport that was ever created? Well, I mean, first of all, obviously as a fan, you know, when I when I uh, was nine years old, I got hooked on pro wrestling, and probably from the time I was a teenager, I just wanted to get involved in the announcing aspect of it. And it, it got to be further and further away as time went on instead of closer. I did a lot of publicity, print media stuff, uh, a lot of magazine writing, wrestling photography, that kind of thing. And I was a publicity writer for the Minneapolis Wrestling Club, the AWA, and specifically Wally Carbo. I had no contact with Vern or Greg at that point. But as far as the broadcasting thing part of it is concerned, um, Always wanted to do it in my own hometown. I wanted to have a TV show, a wrestling show, and figured it was always going to be a pipe dream. But I actually got started doing broadcasting uh, kind of a roundabout way. Uh, a good friend of mine who was no longer with us, Ray Webby, 
uh, was kind of a, uh, a man about town in the Twin Cities, heavily involved in pro wrestling and boxing. And he introduced me to Eddie Sharkey. And then in about 1985, Eddie was doing some local shows in the Twin Cities area at local gymnasiums and armories and that kind of thing, kind of like he is today, you know, 30 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were doing some TV. They were taping, I believe, for you know probably cable in its infancy back then, local cable. And Ray introduced me to Eddie, and Eddie said, you want to come down and do some announcing for us? And I did, and that was kind of the first foray into the actual uh, you know, TV broadcasting part of it. But, I mean, again, since I'm nine years old, all I wanted to do was get involved in pro wrestling from this aspect. I had about a 10-minute uh, longing to be a pro wrestler itself, put on about 60 pounds over a summer, and was working out and everything else, and then it all turned to fat, and I got old, and I started doing broadcasting. So uh, we're, we're a good, literally 50-plus years as a fan, and doing the broadcasting, this is actually my 30th year in the business. Did you ever actually have a wrestling match ever, Mick, or did you just stick to primarily broadcasting and shooting photos ringside? Well, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Um, we had a group in the Twin Cities that was kind of a precursor to the backyard wrestling of today. And this is going back, I mean, literally going back 40-plus years. And one of the guys that I actually had a match with, my first and actually only match in a wrestling ring was with Paul Pershman, the late Playboy Buddy Rose, uh, we had a group, and, and Paul was actually part of it. And uh, so I wrestled him, and I, I think it was in the dead of summer, and he was wearing a, a heavyweight ski mask. And we did it, like, right out in the in the middle of the street in Richfield, Minnesota. Dennis Bockwinkle, uh, who has since passed away, Nick's half-brother, was okay. working for the AWA at the time as a referee and kind of a ring guy. And he snuck us the, the AWA ring the official ring, the legit AWA ring, and we got in there and, and wrestled, and I took one body slam, Ryan, and that was it. That was pretty much it. I just decided there was a much better bet to uh, to do it from behind the microphone, uh, although in later years there was actually another group of us that, uh, unbeknownst to the AWA wrestling office for a while, uh, or they would have absolutely shot me, uh, we were doing, going around doing a little... Uh, impromptu shows at, um, you know, school gymnasiums and, and warming houses at city parks and everything, wrestling on mats, not in a ring, but we were doing it pro style. And uh, I had about a, uh, about a seven or eight year career under a mask, of course, uh, back in the day. So technically, did I wrestle a professional wrestling match? No. Uh, did I get in the ring or on the mats and dabble in it? Yes. What was the name? What was the masked man's name, Mick? You know, it, it, it's um, it's out there. It, it's out there. There's a rumor that I wrestled as the masked super slayer. There's a oh. rumor. Okay. Now, now, now it, it hasn't been confirmed yet, and uh, you know, I'm not going to confirm or deny it. But uh, you know, there is there could be some truth to that, and uh, just a despicable heel, you know, real life kind of typecasting. A despicable heel, and uh, started a few mini riots at some of these city parks, and infuriated the kids, and uh, that they were in attendance. Um, fun stuff. Uh, the AWA got wind of it, and believe it or not, you know this is going back in the day of kayfabe. So when the AWA found out that I was kayfabe, doing what's what, what's that, Mick? Can you explain that for us? What kayfabe it's is nowadays? It, it's, <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a cousin of mine. Uh, they use, they use that word online everywhere. I don't believe it exists anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, but yeah, because I was doing publicity for the AWA at the time, and again, my contact was only with Wally. Uh, they got wind of the fact that I was doing this, and poor Nick Bockwinkle had to be the uh, the heavy the heavy handed one who pulled me to the side after he had come back from Japan only a side at the St. Paul Civic Center and read me the riot act uh, for doing this. Uh, you know, Nick was very protective of the business, and he was astonished that I would go out and do something like that. So, um, yeah, and different time, different place, and, and certainly things have changed. 
Well, let's let's rewind real quick here. I, I read something online. Now, I don't believe everything I read online, but I think this came directly from you. When you were young, did you try to start a fan club for Bobby the Brain Heenan? I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, actually, I had uh, when I was a teenager, I had published some fan club bulletins and newsletters. And yeah, I mean, that was really huge back in the day, Ryan. I mean, obviously, today it's Internet. Everything is out there. But back in the day, you would get a mimeograph machine and you'd put out newsletters and so forth. And in 1971... I used to spend my Saturday afternoons. This is the kind of social life that I had. I spent my Saturday afternoons at the Dykeman Hotel in downtown Minneapolis, which was the home of the AWA wrestling office. And I would sit in the lobby and wait for the boys to come in and, you know, get their autographs and everything else. Well, I had the uh, I had the bug. I wanted to start a fan club for a wrestler, and I had actually done one uh, back in the '60s for the late. Crusher Lasowski and put out a bulletin for Crusher and, you know, had like virtually no contact with him ever. And then uh, seven years later, six years later, I decided I wanted to start one. Well, Bobby Heenan comes into the uh, Dykeman Hotel lobby and he was on his way up to the wrestling office. And I was a big Bobby Heenan fan back in the day. And by God, I'm going to start a fan club for Bobby. So I, I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Heenan, you know, my name is Nick Gartz. I'd like to start a, a wrestling fan club for you. And Bobby said, get the hell out of here. And that was pretty much it. That was that was the end of that. <laughs> that was a good effort. A plus, a plus for effort, Mick. Hey, I tried. I really, <laughs> really tried. And uh, from there, I went to Nick Bockwinkle in the summer of 1971 and started a club for Nick that ran for almost 20 years. So that's uh, – but, yeah, Bobby Bobby was the initial, uh, the initial request, and that got shot down right away. At that point, Bob, Bobby's one of the greatest managers in the history of the professional wrestling business. I have him on my Mount Rushmore for the greatest managers of all time. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I know, and this is you know we're going to kind of skip around here, but fast forward to a Steel Domain Wrestling show. I know you guys had Bobby there when I first broke into the business. So essentially, over the, your pro wrestling career, how close were you and Bobby Heenan uh, as you as you evolved in pro wrestling? You know, it, it took a while actually. I mean, Bobby knew of me for years and primarily through Nick's fan club. And again, this is back in the day. And, you know, Bobby is uh, and always has been a real sarcastic, real quick witted guy. And we would have, um, we would have fan club conventions for Nick uh, when I was running the Bachwinkle fan club back in the seventies. And, and Bobby would show up and he'd kind of make a guest appearance and make fun of us for having the fan club for Nick and all that nonsense. So Bobby knew of me, um, but I hadn't really worked with him on a professional level until the Steel Domain stuff. I mean, he always saw me, you know, taking pictures at the matches or what have you. But uh, when I actually just sat down and, and got to work with him, it was just a kick. It was, uh, I think it was a dream come true. I mean, what, what more could I ask for than sitting next to Bobby Heenan and calling matches in Steel Domain? And you've got the privilege to sit next to and, and work with some of the best talent in the world, and we're going to get to a lot of those, but let's go back now. So what year was it when you officially started your role with the AWA? I started, uh, you're talking about from a broadcasting standpoint? When did you start working for them in general, whether it be broadcasting or doing behind-the-scenes stuff for them? When were you officially associated with the American Wrestling Alliance? I mean, if you, if you want to talk about doing the publicity for them, uh, you're going back to the mid-1970s. Okay. Uh, so a long time. And then uh, there was an association with them because uh, in the early 80s, I was a, a wrestling photographer for Bill Apter and right. Pro Wrestling Illustrated. So I was shooting, I was shooting, the, uh, shooting the matches at ringside. So they knew me there, too, and they knew that I was publishing their stuff from an official broadcast uh standpoint capacity it was in the fall of ninth well summer of 1987 i got a call from greg Ganya, and uh, greg had seen some of my stuff through nick bockwinkle um, nick was trying to open up some doors for me greg had seen it and he asked if i wanted to come down and audition for the for the ring announcer role with the awa and of course i did and he said would you like to come to las vegas once a month and, and do our <clears throat> do our ring announcing and uh, so officially, my debut as an AWA announcer was August 1st of 1987. Okay, perfect. So, I mean, and then 
you also worked with other organizations outside the AWA as well, correct? I did. Um, I, I worked, I had a, a like one night stint, if you even want to talk about that, with uh, WCW. They were doing a double shot. I believe Rochester and then St. Paul. We were looking for a, for a ring announcer. Uh, so, God, I don't even remember the year that this was. So I ring announced for them. I also did uh, ring announcing for Bill Watts' old UWF organization. They ran one show in the Twin Cities back in 1986. They had been on the local market, local TV for about six months. And, I mean, their product was phenomenal. Right. Bill's and, a, a and, fantastic wrestling mind, obviously, as you know. Oh, genius. And I mean, and they loaded up this card, right? I mean, they brought everybody in, and it was at the old Met Center in Bloomington. And, you know, you're in a 15,000 seat building, and I think they drew about five, 600 people. It, I mean, it was just a disaster. <laughs> but I, I did some ring announcing for them, and then also um, the other, I guess, major organization, such as it was, I did something, a uh, couple of stints with the American Wrestling Federation, Warriors of Wrestling, which was based out of uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, back in the mid and then the late 90s. So, you know, that and then, of course, you know, kind of peripheral association with some of the TV shows that we carried on Saturday night at ringside, right. both WCW and, and uh, Global Wrestling Federation, World Class, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've been around the block a couple of times, yeah. And we're going to get to your time with Vern Gagne and the AWA, but I was actually a little bit interested in the AWF. Were, was their structure more of a it, – it's a wrestling organization, structured, rule-like, like boxing. Was that the case for the AWF where they would do rounds? It was kind of like the European wrestling round system more than it was boxing. And if I remember right, it was – I believe they had four – three-minute rounds or four four-minute rounds or something, but in a championship match, they changed the rules so it was 12 rounds. And basically, it was exactly what you would, what you would think. The, the matches would start, and then this is probably part of what killed them, is that they would go into you know some boom, 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 back and forth, and then the time limit would expire for round one. They ring a bell and go to a commercial. And obviously, especially in this day and age, that just was not going to fly. So I think the reason that they did that um, was they wanted to carve a niche. WWE was out there, and WCW was out there, and the AWF actually had pretty good coverage around the country as far as syndication is concerned. And, and uh, Tito Santana and Sergeant Slaughter were the bookers at the time. So there was potential there, but they wanted to do something different. They wanted it. They did not want to be lost in the shuffle. So I don't know. I believe it was Sarge who came up with the idea to do this, you know, twist on the European wrestling. And it just, you know, they had some talent, but the concept didn't work. And not only didn't the concept work, but also they had some absolutely atrocious syndication times around the country. And they tried it once, and it flopped. They came back and did it again, and it, it just kind of got buried under again. And it's funny you bring up their round system and how you would have you know, a couple spots, and all of a sudden the round would end. It's very similar when you're saying that from, from your standpoint to, in, in my eyes, watching a Monday Night Raw or a Friday Night SmackDown where they cut to a commercial break halfway through a match, which is frustrating for me as a wrestling fan. But at least for the fans in attendance at these live events, the match continues. Uh, but I can understand, you know, our frustration level in 2014, being there, you know, in 1990, what was it, 1994, you said, in that area? Yeah, I, I yeah, about there, 595, yeah, something like that. Okay, absolutely. So let's, let's go back then, AWA, working for Vern Gagne. There's a ton of Vern Gagne stories out there. I'm sure you could, you, we could talk for days about Vern Gagne. Uh, yeah. What was the man like? How was it learning from Vern and working for Vern? You know, it, it's really interesting. Um, when I was a kid, Vern Gagne was my hero. I mean, absolute hero. I, this is, uh, you know, a nine-year-old wrestling fan, and there was nobody that, you know, was more idolized in the state of Minnesota as far as a wrestler than Vern. Over the years, um, you know, you start to hear the stories. And, and kind of, you know, and this is all hearsay, right? I, I don't know for sure, but in 1973, 74, something like that, Vern had released a movie 
called The Wrestler. This was the original movie, The Wrestler, not the, mm-hmm. you know, not, not the later the one. Not the Mickey Rourke, yep, absolutely. Exactly. And, I, I mean, campy to a fault. I mean, it was, it, was, it was so bad, it was terrific. I mean, to me, it, it's like the greatest wrestling movie of all time because if you see it, you go back and you see all these guys when they were getting started. Ric Flair and Jim Brunzel and guys like this, and then, and then you got Billy Graham and Wahoo McDaniel and all these guys. But uh, the reason that I bring that up is that that was a big deal for Vern and it kind of, it, it was not the success that he wanted it to be. And I knew some people in the wrestling office that basically said when, when that happened, Vern's personality kind of kind of changed a little bit. Uh, he got to be more of a harder-edged guy. The, the temper started to flare a little bit. It was, it was kind of like all of a sudden Vern's ego really started to take hold. And, you know, you hear the stories from the outside looking in for years and years, and there are some guys that made a fortune with Vern, but yet they will bad and, and you were And you were definitely one of those guys who made a fortune, correct, Nick? Am I right? Uh, you know what? Way beyond a fortune. Yeah, I, mean, I would I, think I, so. Lifetime of cash. Yeah, of course. You know, and as I sit here right now, I'm literally I'm looking at stacks of money. And this is what I do. I, I'm talking to you. I'm looking at stacks of money and my old Vern Gagne poster. So I, I'm sad. <laughs> But uh, Vern really did kind of change. And then all these guys that say, ah, Vern was horrible to work with, a lot of them stayed with Vern for, you know, 20, 30 years, made a ton of money, didn't go anywhere else. But yet, after the fact, you know, they got negative things to say about him. That's weird. I've never heard heard of somebody running a wrestling company and then all of his employees saying bad things about him after they leave. That's weird. (laughs) Yeah, can you imagine that? No, couldn't couldn't, couldn't even imagine hearing about that. (laughs) No. Uh, The the story that I heard most about Vern, and this was verified by a few of the guys that I talked to, was that Vern, especially in the 80s, the early 80s, had the you need me, I don't need you mentality. And this went up to and including Hulk Hogan. I mean, it was basically, you know, I, I made you, and yeah, go ahead, go wherever else you want to go, and it doesn't make any difference. A guy that had mentioned that to me specifically was uh, Steve Regal, not uh, obviously not Lord Stephen Regal, but um, Mr. Le- Electricity Steve Regal, who was okay. a WA light heavyweight champion. And, uh, when he left, he did some independent stuff. I had a chance to talk to him. He said, you know, it, it, it was basically that kind of thing where it wasn't the money because Vern was a pretty decent payoff guy, especially to the guys on top. It wasn't an NWA schedule where you had to work six, seven days a week. You worked three days, and you had four days off, and you still made a terrific living, and, and Bachwinkle will testify to that. But uh, Steve Regal would basically say that was Vern's attitude, you know, Hey, if you don't like it here, fine. You know, you think you can do better someplace else? Here's the door. So it was that kind of attitude that I had heard, you know, uh, pretty consistently over the years. When I started with Vern, I didn't see any of that necessarily. But you got to remember, when I came on board in 1987, the wheels were falling off the bus for the AWA. It was the beginning really at the end they probably had another three years left or whatever but i saw Vern in really stressful situations um where his pressure would just get out of control did he treat me badly for the most part no you know there's kind of a well-publicized incident that i had with him um but but despite all that it was an honor for me to work for Vern Gagne. And, you know, and and I can say, yeah, I, I worked with my childhood hero. wasn't necessarily what I had expected. Um, were the were the criticisms about Vern correct, and were they justified? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they were. And I mean, you get that a lot with promoters, whether it be old time or even the promoters nowadays. If they, you know, if we actually want to classify him as a promoter, one thing I want to bring up with you, Mick, is I watched the Vince McMahon podcast last night with Stone Cold after Raw on the WWE Network, and Vince brought up something and I wanted to ask you because you were prevalent in the territorial system, and I don't know, did you watch or listen to the podcast last I night? I haven't with- seen it yet. Nope, I have not seen it. 
So they, they asked, or Stone Cold asked Vince about buying up all these territorial systems, and, and Vince said he approached Vern Gagne first, asked him to basically purchase the territorial system, uh, basically on a payoff and a balloon payment at the end, and, and Vern pretty much told him at that point to, to bug off. Um, you know, some young kid with, with no money that wanted to buy him out. But when they asked Vince why the territory system crashed, you know, Stone Cold alluded to the fact that he bought his competition or he put them out of business. Vince said that he didn't put them out of business. The territorial systems themselves put themselves out of business because they refused to invest their money back into the product, unlike he did. What, what would be your two cents on that statement from Vince as far as you know, he says, I took the money that I got. I invested it back into my product. I made it better when the territorial systems put the money in their pocket and not back into their product. You know that's really a, that's it's, it's such a convoluted deal. Um, there is some truth to what Vince says. What I saw was that um, the, the the promoters that thought that they could defeat Vince that would get together. Yeah, I think it was more the infighting among the other promoters that were supposedly going to work together and they were going to knock Vince off his perch and everything else, all the old school promoters and promoters are promoters, you know, I, and it's like, you know, whatever you want to say about them, you get a bunch of them that allegedly are going to work together for the common good. You know, that's not going to happen. It, it's mm-hmm. just not. And I think I, I, in Vern's case, you know, he tried to work uh, with a couple of promoters, pro wrestling USA and then he tried to do stuff with Super Clash, and then Jared is going to work with this one and that one. But nobody could trust anybody at the end of the day, and so everybody failed while Vince stood by just laughing. And to Vince's credit, when he talks about the money that he invested and put it back in his product, absolutely that's what he did. With WrestleMania, you know, when Vince rolled the dice on WrestleMania, he, I mean, that was really a gamble because if that wouldn't have worked for him, he would have been out of business. Right. And I'm talking totally out of business, not just working the, you know, the East Coast territory. So he rolled the dice and that gamble paid off. And yeah, he did. He continued to do whatever he wanted to do. Uh, an old school guy like me, I hate what Vince did to the business. I, I hate it. I'm just, there's so much about the modern product that I dislike. But to his credit, he was aggressive. He didn't back out from anybody. He reinvested his money wisely. He made a multi, multi trillion, gazillion operation out of this while the other promotions ate each other alive and couldn't figure out what to do and, and what are we going to do now? And you screwed me. And this, I want my guy on top if we're going to run a, a co promotion. And no, I want my guy on top, and it was just a disaster. There was just no way they were going to catch this. No way. Right. And, yeah, I mean, it, everybody has their own opinion on what happened with the territorial system. Me, as a young kid in this business, I wish it still existed so we had other places to work on a consistent basis. And, and hell, you'd have a better chance of making a living doing it uh, if pro wrestling was as hot as it used to be. And Obviously, one thing from the territorial system that was really big, and we, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, was you know, kayfabe. And with things like podcasts and the dirt sheets, and yes, I, you know, I run a podcast, so I get it as well. But last night, Vince really opened the, the door to certain decisions. Why did he job out Taker at WrestleMania? Are we going to see Sting you know, at this year's WrestleMania in Macho Man? I mean, he gave away some things that you know, back when you were involved in pro wrestling, you just didn't do that. As an old school guy yourself, I, I would assume one thing when it comes to the kayfabe, but what's your take on the world of kayfabe and professional wrestling as, as far as when you were in it to com, you know to the basically non-existence now in 2014? There's, there's absolutely no comparison. I mean, it is, unless you lived through it, you really have no idea how secretive everybody was. And I mean totally secretive. Um, you know, if you were, uh, if you were an outsider and you walked into a locker room, I mean, that locker room shut up. Uh, if you were a reporter asking questions about pro wrestling, it was legit. If you were a wrestler who came on TV and you were, at, and I'm not talking about Dave Schultz and John Stossel. Right. I'm and I was actually going to talk, bring about that up too, but I'm glad you actually mentioned it. Yeah, I you know I mean it, it's if you're an old school guy and they ask you are these matches you know predetermined yeah, absolutely not I mean there was no there was no secret that wasn't kept 
about the business. And, you know, as I look back on it, I mean, from my perspective, and this is really funny because, again, I mentioned Bach Winkle only because of my relationship with him, but uh, Nick knew what I knew, but I never treaded into that territory when I was talking to him. And I've known Nick 40-some years. If I would stand at the Minneapolis Auditorium and watch a match with Bach Winkle, you know, in the, in the catacombs of the arena, he, he'd be watching the match and even though he knew what I knew, he would still like wince if a guy did this or, or he'd say, oh, that was a stupid move or whatever. So Nick wasn't breaking cafe and it drove, drove me absolutely crazy. I hated it. I just wanted to say to him, give me a break. You know, how stupid do you think I am? What have you? I didn't. I respected that. I never asked anything. And as I look back on it, I'm really missing those days of kayfabe. Uh, because he, here's here's the way I look at it, and I, and I don't know if this, this will make any sense to you. If a guy like Mick Foley says, you know, this is predetermined and he'll write his, his books, and I'm not, I'm not picking on Foley, but he's a perfect example, and he explains everything about the business and all the secrets are out there, and then he goes to the top of the cage and he falls through the cage onto the floor and he goes through a table and his, his tooth comes out of his nose. Why should I believe that that is real? If you've told me that everything you do is fake, why should I believe it? Why should I believe any injuries? Why should I believe when they say Daniel Bryan is out with a serious neck injury? Why should I not just assume that's a storyline? Because you have told me wrestling is predetermined. You've told me these are storylines. You've told me that you're, you know, great athletes, but you know, you know how to fall and whatever it is. So in, in that sense, I just, it's really hard for me as an old school guy. And, and I, you know, I mean, I could go on and on about this. I mean, on the independent level, you know, I go in this, into some buildings where guys are running the show and I'll see the guys and there's, there's 30, 40 people standing there people from the outside that haven't bought tickets yet, and they're, they're rehearsing their match beforehand. Mm-hmm. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Or the match is over, and you just had a bloodbath with this guy, and then the two of you are going to sit in the audience up in the boosters yeah. and talk to your girlfriends right afterward talking about your match. Um, it, it's a suspension of disbelief, and it's just totally gone, totally and completely gone. And us old school guys, it's it's a hard pill to swallow. I agree with you 100 percent on what you just mentioned. I, I'm okay if somebody comes to me at, at this point and says, you know, pro wrestling's predetermined. Yeah, that's fine. But when they tell me pro wrestling's fake, that's when I get upset. You know, there, I think there's a difference between yes, it's predetermined. We're not fooling anybody. Everybody knows now because it's been so publicized that the outcomes are predetermined. But you cannot tell me that falling on your back feels good. You cannot tell me getting busted open the hard way feels great. Wrestling's not fake, and that's what really pisses me off more than anything. And what you alluded to it too on independent levels, you know, you know that night you're working so and so, and you walk past the line at the door, or you're in the ring rehearsing your match, or like you mentioned, the thing that really irritated me, I think more than anything, is I just went to town with an Ari Davari, and now him and I are out in the crowd chatting, sharing a drink. You just don't do right. that. And I think in 2014, that's where kayfabe still is should be intact. Uh, but it, it, in some places, the promoter doesn't do anything about it, and I don't understand it. And it r- really frustrates me uh, as well. And, you know, we're talking about some old school stuff, a couple things here too. And, and my, there, are, there are things I think are very important in pro wrestling that we've kind of gone away from in today's product. One is basically just the backstage interview, a decent old school interview like you do. Uh, and um, basically, you know, I guess the old school interviewing first and then the rules in professional wrestling, because it doesn't seem like there's rules anymore in professional wrestling. You maintained an old school interview style throughout the time that I worked with you on the independent level. Was that your preference of interviewing and that's what you feel is the best? Or is it just your character basically in 2014 that you feel it's you know, the absolute best way to go about conducting a backstage interview? I don't think there's anything better in wrestling than the old school Pro Bowl. And whether or not it's me conducting the interview, um, and, and again, part of the, uh, the way that I conduct an interview, I'm selling everything. I mean, I, I just, you know, whether I'm at the at the mic side calling the match or if I'm doing the interview, I don't care if it's the facial expressions, I don't care if it's, you know, putting something over almost to a fault way over the top. 
I would rather do that than sit there and, you know, crack jokes and, and you know, talk about something else or, you know, uh, it's, it's my job to present this as real. And so the people, again, for that couple hours, they can suspend the disbelief. As far as the promos are concerned, that's another thing that drives me crazy. And I know I'm sounding like an old codger putting a knock on the business in this day and age. Back then, I mean, back, you know, even 30 years ago, a guy like Mad Dog Vashon, a guy like The Crusher, Bachwinkle, whoever it is, Bobby Heenan is a perfect example. They go into the studio, and they would they would be there literally all day long cutting specific promos for whatever market they were going to be in. If they had... You know, the next month they were going to be in Rockford and Chicago and Green Bay and Denver and then Minneapolis. The guys would sit there for 13, 14 hours and they would cut promos for each specific market. But they would go out there and they knew what they had to get across. They would have two minutes to get it across, not 25 minutes to start the show, which is ridiculous, you know, that every show starts starts with a hot shot angle and 25 minutes of of bullshit. They would go out there and say, hey, you know what, Bobby Heenan, you know, Bobby, go out there and let's talk about your, you know, your match with Tito Santana in Rockford. And Bobby would say, you know, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with that jumping beat. I'm going to run around him so many times he'll think he's at a taco stand someplace. And, I mean, whatever it is, and there was no teleprompters, there was no cue cards, there was nothing. They didn't have to redo and redo and redo. It was genius. And so to me, when I see these guys, you know, if you watch these the, the WWE interviews, and I mean, you've been backstage, right? I mean, you know how this stuff goes. Yeah. You know, they got the cue cards, they got the teleprompters, so Renee Young asked them a question, and they never looked directly at her when they're answering her. They're looking off over at, at the cue card. Horrible. Um, I remember I was at a TNA taping down in Orlando, and Matt Morgan, he had some index cards with him because they were going to cut an in-ring spontaneous promo with him a little bit later on. And this poor slob is walking back and forth for an hour, memorizing his lines and having to remember exactly what he was going to say and getting frustrated and starting over again. I'm thinking, good God almighty, you guys don't get it. Go out there, just get your point across and be done with it. But it's the nature of the beast. They're selling a show. They're selling a pay-per-view. They're filling 25 minutes of airtime at the start of the show. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's all part of the entertainment TV package these days. Not so much the wrestling package, the TV package. Yeah, and I'm confused. You know, when you bring back a part-time superstar like The Rock nowadays or Stone Cold, they don't script their promos, and they're so much better than the guys that are sitting there, like a Roman Reigns who's live via satellite cutting an extremely scripted promo, and it just sounds so awful and so bad. I don't understand why they don't go back to that way. On the indie scene, we don't have – I mean, you, a promoter might say, I want you to kind of get this and this over, but we don't have scripted promos. It's up to us to make it look and, and sound good. Uh, I'd be frustrated getting a cue card saying, hey, you know, Ryan, this is what you have to do tonight. I, it would frustrate me so bad. And working with you is great. You know, if you cut a backstage promo with me or whoever – if they were lost ever in a promo, you are such a professional that you would guide us in the right direction or you would feed off of us like a mean Gene Okerlund, you know, somebody who is known for how good they were at, at doing that. Now, your skills were, were awesome. Obviously, back in the AWA days, they're, they're awesome now. Two things that come to mind, a WWF at the time, WWE now, extended an offer to you to come work for them. Why didn't you take it, Mick? Well, this is a story that I told many times, but uh, I, I guess it bears repeating. It wasn't so much an offer as it was an offer for a tryout. Okay. And uh, this is right between the AWA, right after I had left the AWA and started the Saturday night at Ringside Wrestling Block in Minneapolis. And this is back in 1988, uh, March of 88. And I had been on the air for just a couple of weeks, and Jack Lanza, who was working for the WWF office at the time, I had known Jack for years in his AWA run. Um, he was an agent, and he called me up, and this, again, is right when I started the, the wrestling block. Plus, I had a daughter that had just been born. She literally was about a week old, and I got a call from Jack. He says, WWF is doing a TV taping up in Duluth. Vince is coming in for the TV taping. 
would you like to come in for a tryout? Uh, I told Vince, you know, I like your stuff. I've seen you on television. I think you'd be a good fit for us. Can you make it to this taping? And I said, uh, I said, well, here's a deal, Jack. I said, let me let me get back on this. I I love the offer. I think this is terrific. What a great opportunity. But I just started this wrestling block. I just committed to this station, and I got a newborn child at home. I'm not sure that the timing is is great. So he says, okay. He says, but you cannot say a word to anybody about this phone call, about this conversation. So let me know what's going on. He said, at the very least, I want you to send me a tape. And if you can't make the taping, I will give the tape to Vince and I'll let him see it. So said, okay, that's great. Um, he says, because I really want you to you know, get this job and, and so on and so forth. Well, hang up the phone. And I realize I haven't gotten an address from Jack Lanza. Uh, I have no idea where to send this tape. He told me not to breathe a word of this to anybody. I don't know how to get a hold of Jack. Uh, kids, bottom kids, line mind is, you, mind you, kids. This is pre cell phone, pre caller ID days. So exactly, just FYI. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, yeah, you have to put everything in context. I mean, so it doesn't sound like this lame excuse. I really didn't know how to get a hold of Jack Lanza. I knew he lived in town here, but, you know, I didn't know. And then I'm thinking, okay, if I try to get old of Jack through WWF, well, that's the last thing I want to do. He told me not to tell anybody, you know, why I would want to get old of Jack Lanza. So, uh, long story short, I didn't make the tryout, and I had no way to send Jack the tape. I, I should back up, and I uh, say that Jack actually, in response to me saying to him, Jack, if I don't make this tryout, am I – shooting myself in the foot, am I going to bury myself with Vince from that point on? He said, no, absolutely not. He said, Vince is a real understanding guy. If the timing isn't right, you know, you'll be fine down the road. He'll get a hold of you again. Just make sure I get the tape. All right, so WWF runs a show in, uh, I believe, the Met Center in Bloomington, maybe five, six weeks later. And, of course, you know, I missed the tryout, had nowhere to send the tape to Jack. And I walk into the locker room because uh, I was doing some stuff for the for the Saturday Night at Ringside show. And Jack looks at me and says, oh, there you are, you asshole. <laughs> I says, uh-huh. <laughs> and I knew he was talking to me <laughs> for some reason. And uh, he said, where was that tape? I said, Jack, you told me uh, I never had an address from you. I didn't know where to send the tape. And he just basically says, ah, bullshit. And WWF never called again, never knocked on the door again. Um, in retrospect, did I make a mistake? No, I don't think so. For a couple of reasons, I'm not sure that I was ready. Uh, another thing is that there was a revolving door of announcers going in and out of WWF at the time. Just a ton of guys. I mean, from Craig to George and Sean Mooney and Jack Reynolds and Ken Resnick and Rod Trongard and Roger Kent, all these guys were coming in and out. I just got a newborn child at home. Do I want to relocate to Stamford, Connecticut right at that point on a wing and a prayer? I wasn't ready. Um, I, I would probably do the same thing all over again, but they never called again. There was a revolving door of people going in there, but Mick, nobody had your stunning good looks and that mustache. I mean, that thing stood out, and that got the ladies. When you were on SNR, I mean, I'm telling you, the ladies must have been trying to, to, to knock down your door for a date. You know, I'm sure that the D and Ready D is for delusional because I'm going to tell you <laughs> something. Uh, not only did that mustache look like a, a caterpillar family had been blown up in, in a freak accident, it was horrible. And I can't think of one person outside of Medusa Michelli who I basically begged to do a certain spot with me that really gave a rat's ass one way or another if I was on SNR. So the good looks and the mustache, I, I don't think that anybody really missed out on, on much of anything there, Bill, but I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. Got one more thing here, and then we're going to do a little word association, and then we're going to touch on today's product with you. One more thing. Now, I, whether it was a, a podcast or a YouTube video, I don't remember what it was. I was listening to it lately, but you were the number one choice for ECW over Joey Styles. You never got an offer from Paul Heyman, but you were in contact with him. What what was that all about? I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, if you were there instead of Joey Styles, how different the announcing would have been because Joey's very high pitched. But what, where did that come about, and and how in depth and how serious did these talks with Paul get? 
Well, Paul and I had worked together in the AWA days. Um, he was there basically the same time that I was. They brought him in, and uh, he was managing Tommy, uh, not Tommy Rich. He was managing Adrian Adonis and the original Midnight Express at the time. And Paul and I hit it off right away. We'd known each other. So many of us started as like fan club editors or wrestling photographers or something like that. Myself and Paul and Jim Cornette and the late Eddie Gilbert. So we all had kind of that thing in common. And when we were with Vern, Paul and I would have these heart to hearts all the time, you know, about his ideas that Vern wouldn't listen to. And, you know, I would share some ideas that Paul thought were good. But uh, after he left um, and went to, uh, I think he went to Continental, I, I don't remember. But um, Paul was actually the guy that was influential in getting me the Saturday night at ringside block, just to kind of back up. He put me in touch in, with Joe Petticino. Joe calls and says there's a Channel 23 in Minneapolis going to do this wrestling block. They need somebody to host it. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, one thing led to another. So Paul and I had had this history. And then I want to say this is 92, something like that, give or take. I remember Paul calling me up just on a whim, and we were just kind of shooting the shit a little bit. And, and Paul says, you know, I'm going to be involved with such and such a promotion, and when it gets off the ground, you know, you're going to be my guy. You know, I said, I'll get back to you. I can't give you a lot of detail about it uh, right now, but there's some things in the works. You stay by the phone, I'm going to get back to you, and, and everything's going to be great. Never heard another word from Paul. All of a sudden, there's ECW out there, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, is this what he was talking about? And then lo and behold, I see on these uh, ECW DVDs, like Forever Hardcore or Hardcore Hope coming or something, where Joey Styles says, yeah, it had not been me, it was going to be Nick Karch. It was going to be this guy. But I never had a direct offer from Paul nothing like that all we had was this preliminary discussion about this mysterious promotion that he was going to be involved in and you know again day late dollar short never happened but i'm flattered i'm really flattered that uh, i would be even considered for the for the position it was really cool to hear your name in that pod i think it was a podcast and, and i was like i know that guy i mean this is i didn't know this before so it was something that really stood to me and I, I definitely want to touch base with you on that um, I'm going to go ahead and name off a couple names here for you, Mick, and if you, in a couple sentences, if you want to basically describe the individual, whether it be your friendship, their work rate, their talent, whatever it might be. Um, we're going to start with a, a guy that obviously you uh, are very close to in the business is Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, to me, when they talk about the greatest heavyweight champions of the modern era, and by modern era, I'm going back probably 45 years, I, it's Bockwinkle. Uh, you can talk about Ric Flair all you want. Uh, Rick Flair, a great flamboyant wrestler, but Flair had the same match over and over and over again for 30, 40 years. And this is not to take anything away but from how colorful Flair was. And, you know, I mean, Flair is Flair. Is Flair. But Nick could make a broomstick look good. And he held uh, the championship not only, uh, not only did he wrestle the AWA territories, but back in the day, he would go down to Florida and wrestle NWA territory. He did the same thing in Texas, and then he'd go to Japan, or he'd go up to Toronto as the AWA champion, and he did it with class and dignity, and he sold his ass off for everybody. Uh, brilliant mind for the business. I think Nick is just in a class by himself. All right, Mick, next on the list. Playboy Buddy Rose. Um, God. Uh, I met Buddy Rose. I met Paul Persman when he was a fan just going to the TV matches in Minneapolis. He wanted to be a pro wrestler. That's all he wanted to do. He dropped out of high school uh, to start training to become a professional wrestler. When he got into the business, he got his ass handed to him a couple of times at the training camp by uh, Larry Hainini, uh, Lars Anderson, and Billy Robinson. I mean, they beat the tar out of him. But he kept coming back. He came back for more, and he had perseverance. And when he first got in, I mean, he was, you know, probably 180 pounds, dripping wet. Great talent, learned a lot from Ray Stevens. It's very, very sad what happened to Paul. I mean, even when he was, you know, a 300 pounder, he was still doing stuff kind of like Adrian Adonis bumping his ass up around the ring, great ring general. And he just kind of, he had his demons 
and he let himself go. I think the last time I saw him was in 04, 03, something like that, and he was well over 400 pounds, and uh, just tragic. I mean, he, he could have been one of the all-time greats. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Um, how, about, how about your buddy Wally Carbo, the man who, it sounds like he was a big mentor and kind of a big influence on your career. Wally was great. You know, Wally had a television persona that uh, he came across as, you know, kind of, uh, you know, absent-minded professor kind of guy. Um, you know, and he would have this kind of stupid mentality on TV with his fines and suspensions and everything else. But Wally Carbo, Wally had a brilliant mind for wrestling. He was involved in it for probably 60, 65 years. And Wally was always the buffer between the boys and Vern in the day. Um, you know, if they had a beef, Wally would kind of be the father figure and try to calm things down and you know, smooth the waters a little bit. And um, again, it's kind of sad. You know, Wally's career, uh, he, he took he took a lot of abuse mentally from Vern, from what I'm told. Again, I wasn't there. It's hearsay. This is what I got from Wally. Uh, they would fight like cats and dogs. Wally finally decided he wanted to get out of the business. He and Vern were 50-50 partners, and um, Wally wanted to, uh, or Vern wanted to buy out Wally's end of the business, and Wally wound up selling for about 10 cents on the dollar. So it was a pretty uh, pretty shitty way to end things, but uh, Wally was a character. God, he was a character. You know, you look at him. This guy had more women than probably Ric Flair. I mean, there were women in every city, Denver, Omaha, wherever he went, uh, that just were all over Wally. Never know how to look at him, but, uh, but they loved him. Wally Carbo. All right. I just found my new favorite guy. There next you go. On, next, on the li- next on the list, Mick, Lord Alfred Hayes. Um, probably one of the nicest guys that I ever had an opportunity to meet or work with in the business. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people, modern-day wrestling fans, just remember Lord Alfred from his, uh, his WWF days where he was kind of a comic foil and doing the commercials and, you know, you know, you know, brought to you by, you know, he'd go into a commercial or he'd have stuff poured over his head or something. He was a great, great wrestler in his day, and he was a legit tough guy over in England. Uh, I think he was a black belt. What Sadly, again, you know, so much of this stuff ends up negatively. Lord Al, uh, when he was released from WWF, uh, he was hit by a car, actually. I think he lived in New England, and he was hit by a car, and it was a real serious, serious injury. And they did some surgery on him. They had to remove, like, three inches of vertebrae or spine or something. So when I actually started working with Al in the AWF days, he was all of maybe five foot five. I mean, he had really lost that much. He was hunched over. I uh, eventually wound up in a wheelchair and, and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you. As nice a guy, as much of a gentleman, and uh, a true professional, when people say to me, what's what's the highlights in your career, I don't think there's anything greater than working alongside Lord Alfred Hayes. He treated me with respect, and uh, we got along great, and just a, a sweetheart of a guy, and I miss him a lot. Um, that was a real loss when, when he passed away. Yeah, anytime it seems like anytime you lose somebody in wrestling, uh, wrestling is a huge family. In the outside world, will never realize that unless you're part of it. And, and I think Jake the Snake really hit it on the head with his Hall of Fame speech in the WWE this year. And if you haven't listened to it, I, I highly suggest anybody listening to this podcast to go to the network or YouTube or whatever you can to listen to it. It'll kind of give you a glimpse on what wrestling is to us inside the business, inside the industry. Yeah. Uh, we're we're very close and we're a different group of people, but when you lose somebody, it's like losing a brother or a sister, and it's it's very diff- difficult for you know, obviously you working alongside with him, but it's even sad for somebody like me who you know watched some of his stuff, and uh, it's just it's never fun. So um, and, and that'll you know I, I want to talk about another guy here. We're gonna have him on the show January sixth. That is he was known as Kamikaze Ken Anderson here in the Midwest before he went to WWE as Mr. Kennedy. You had an opportunity to work with him before he made it big, and you had an opportunity obviously to work with him recently. What's your thoughts on Ken? I think Ken is a great guy. Um, I, I always have fun working with him. I think he's very talented. Um, I think, you know, Ken's got a personality that kind of rubs some people the wrong way. You know, there's some documented 
you know, incidents with some of the wrestlers in WWF or WWE that he didn't get along with very well. Uh, he speaks his mind, and uh, but I, I just I love working with him. Um, very very funny guy, very witty guy, and uh, I'm surprised. I guess I'm surprised with the the level of success that he's reached. I expect him to even get more success than he has. And maybe that's because, you know, he was in TNA for a while, and we know, you know, as much as they try, they flounder. Um, but I think Ken's days are still ahead of him, his best days. And uh, just, uh, just a fun, fun guy to work with. Whenever I see him, it's like old home week. Uh, you know, we pick up right where we left off. You know, they turn the camera on to cut a promo, and, uh, and we're there. We're right back there. And it was a pleasure to be there with him at the very beginning, and it's a pleasure to work with him now. It's funny, we, Travis and I were actually watching some stuff on the network the other day, and the Brothers of Destruction DVD was something on there, so we clicked on it because we're both big fans of, of Taker and Kane, obviously, but they showcased a match with Ken uh, on there, and it was, you know, thinking that Ken, and I met him, you know, backstage at an ACW show in Green Bay, Wisconsin, I worked with him in Eau Claire for Heavy on Wrestling with, with you guys, that he got to work with one of the biggest names in the wrestling business of all time, and I'm excited to ask him about that. It's going to be really cool to hear his, you know, his stories about working with some of these big guys. But I agree. I think that, you know, they obviously pushed him really early on in his WWE career. And unfortunately, whether it be backstage politics or whatever it was, it cut his his time there short. Uh, but he's making yeah. the best of TNA, and he he ended up being a TNA World Champion, which was fantastic. And, and the biggest yeah. thing with Ken is that he's he's had some great wrestling days, but we know his. Probably the biggest day of his career is going to be here. In about a month, he'll be on the pencil with us. I'm sure he's looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, my God, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, I, I, and I'll tell him. I, I will tell him firsthand from firsthand knowledge. Yeah, and absolutely. Been there. I still get, you know what, we're 40 minutes into this, and I still got butterflies talking. Ch- chapter one of Ken Anderson's book in 15 years is going to be about the pencil, I bet. <laughs> well, oh, of course. Hell next, yeah. on the, next on the list for you, Mick, is Scrap Daddy Adam Pierce. Oh, uh, um. There's another guy that I was fortunate enough, and I mean that. I mean, I'm not just saying that. I am really fortunate to say that when Adam first started getting a little notoriety at Steel Domain Wrestling, that I was there to call his initial matches, you know, with the long hair and the, you know, and the baby fat and everything else, and, and the, him and Ace Steel, and, and uh, of course, Colt Cabana and the guys from back then, Danny Dominion and Adrian Lynch. Um, I think Adam Pierce is probably, and it's going to sound funny because this is a five-time NWA champion, I think he's still the most underrated guy in wrestling. Um, and how do you say that about an NWA champion? He just is. I mean, the NWA has changed, so it obviously doesn't have the notoriety and the luster that it did in the Ric Flair days. But still, Adam Pierce, he's so good. He is so damn good in the ring and you have to be to kind of transcend the two eras because he's an old school guy. He's an old school heel. He knows all about the psychology. It's not about high spots, boom, 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 and flippy flop, hurricane rodas and everything else. He's got a methodical style. He plays the crowd. Uh, he's just really, really good. And he's an honest guy. He's a straight shooter. He's professional to a fault. And uh, I can't say enough good things about him. He's the best stick guy I've ever seen in my oh, in my life. And that's and yeah. I'm saying I've watched WWF, WWE, ECW, WCW. He is the absolute best stick guy I have ever seen. And that's I, I've watched Ric Flair and I've watched some of these Stone Cold. I still think he's the best I've ever seen. And it's remarkable how good he is at getting over what he wants to get over. And I really think that's a big reason why WWE has been bringing him down to NXT and now – speculation that the next period of his career is going to be maybe being hired on full-time as a trainer down at XT, which would be absolutely awesome for those kids down in Orlando. If he was full-time there and is able to help that system, that that would be so beneficial for those guys. And if that's where it's going in his, in his life, more power to him. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but I really hope it does when he decides that his days in the ring as far as competing on a regular basis are over. It would be, be so good for him. Um, well, here's here's what's great. Just one more comment about Adam. I mean, it's it's uh, to talk about his professionalism. Here you got a guy. I mean, we've run a couple of, of Steel Domain shows in the last couple of years where Adam has come in. He's worked Colt Cabana a couple of times. 
and he'll send these promos around the horn, you know, that he makes at home or whatever, and they're so damn good. And these aren't promos for a TV audience. Uh, these are promos for the specific market where he's going to be wrestling in front of maybe 500 people, maybe 700 people. And he's so good, and he's so meticulous in what he says. And just like you said, he gets the point across. He knows exactly what to say. He draws you in with every single word that he says. And I, I just think it, it's just a shame as far as I'm concerned. I mean, like TNA, when they had that, that ridiculous gut check thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Adam <laughs> that, yeah. was in. How in the hell did that happen? I mean, if any guy could have possibly helped save TNA, I'm not saying he could have, but maybe uh, Adam Pierce was the guy, and I really think they missed the boat. All right, looking at your Steel Domain days, Colt Cabana and CM Punk both. Let's put them in the same category. You can take both of them for a couple sentences on each. Oh man, it, it's too completely how e- different. How easy? How easy is that? <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, it's two totally different animals. I mean, uh, it, it's funny you get these guys coming in from the same background in, in Chicago, but two completely different animals in how they are perceived in the wrestling business and how they actually look at the business. Punk is so serious, and I mean, he's not, not a somber guy. I mean, he's a he's a fun loving guy. So is a you know he's he's great. But you definitely, you definitely could fool some people if they've listened to the Colt Cabana podcast in the last week. You probably could fool some people if he's a fun-loving guy, but that's another story, and it's, it's um, obviously bringing that full circle. Yeah, you had a chance to work with both those guys when they were driving miles and miles for small paydays, and that's you know really what was it like working with them back then before they made it? You know, as far as Punk, he made it big, obviously, and, and Scotty uh, came close, but he's still doing pretty well for himself today. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you knew the guys were good, and you knew that they were entertaining. And, you know, Steel Domain, the guys that SDW was bringing in, hadn't been seen in the Twin Cities before. This was, you know, we had the same guys over and over again, and all of a sudden this contingent comes in from Chicago. So you knew how good they were, and Punk was over huge. Punk was over, you know, as a baby face back then. Uh, he'd walk into the, you know, the West St. Paul Armory, and, my God, the, the roof blew off the place. So you knew that they were good. Did we think, yeah, these guys are going to be world champions someday? No. I mean, you don't think that. You don't think 15 years down the road or whatever. Um, but when you think, I mean, you think of the roster. I mean, my God, you got Adam Pierce, Colt Cabana, and CM Punk all at the same time on the same roster. And look where they are today, you know, going into, you know, 2010 to 11, 12, 13, whatever. Um, they're just they're extraordinary, and uh, I mean, and again, I'm I'm blessed. I was lucky enough to work with them. Scotty is uh, he's such a funny guy. I mean, he really is. There's so much about him. You can see it when he's in the ring, um, like if he's doing the Mad Classic or whatever he's doing. That he's just loving his time out there. Mm-hmm. And Punk, on the other hand, you know, there's a dark side to him, and uh, so that's why I say two different animals, but just they're great great talents yeah and that was as far as me when i broke in punk was already gone from steel domain he was into his ring of honor days uh scotty was doing his thing i worked plenty of shows with scott but those are the names that i always heard you know guys like me aria craven the, the names in minnesota that were younger talent that people thought you know these these are the kids that might be the next ones out of this territory we kept hearing about the austin aries the ken andersons the the cm punks and it drove me to want to be better because not that I was tired about hearing about these guys, but I wanted to kind of create our own legacy. And they, um, they were fantastic, and they really drove me to try to be the best that I could be. So I appreciate everything they did on the indie scene. Great seeing those guys accomplish things on the big stage. Uh, whether you know Colt's obviously accomplishing things, whether it be social media, but he still makes a living doing this. Adam obviously makes a living doing this, and Punk uh, made more than a living doing this. So really cool that they uh, you know spent time in, in Steel Domain, and you had a chance to work with them. And the last name I have here for you, and unfortunately we talked about people passing away in pro wrestling, and just recently, as of the last couple of days, you and I both uh, were made aware of the passing of AWA ring ring legend. Uh, Roger Kent. What I guess I know you you mentioned some things on social media about Roger. And is there anything that you'd want to say about him as an individual uh, and you know the unfortunate circumstances that just happened? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Roger, it, it's really interesting. Uh, Roger was the voice of the AWA, and I'm not, I, I don't mean this to sound disparaging. Roger was not a terrific wrestling announcer, you know, in the truest sense of the word. He wouldn't, you know, call a series of holds or whatever it was, but he, he had phrases that were directly, you hear that phrase back in the day, and it's a Roger Kentism. Uh, you know, he poleaxed him. He's big enough to go bear hunting with a switch, whatever. Roger's uh, announcing style was pretty unique, but he had such a recognizable voice. And, you know, if you grew up in the AWA territory, you know, way back, it was Marty O'Neill when I was growing up, but right after that, it was Roger Kent for all those years. And, um, you know, from a personal standpoint, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned on social media, you know, Back in the day, um, you know, I had a little little incident with Roger that, you know, he heard I was I wanted to become a wrestling announcer. He didn't like it. I think he felt threatened at the time, not just by me, but, you know, Roger was, you know, getting on in years. He wasn't real happy working with Vern. And he, he basically told me, I don't want you screwing with my income. It'll be a big mistake if you do. Well, by the time I got in, Roger was already, you know, off to WWF and, uh, Years later, when I had him on a guest, as a guest on my show, he was terrific. Of course, he went on and still put the bad mouth on Vern, you know, uh, probably, you know, 15 years after he had left Vern. But um, in the annals of wrestling, I mean, you know, in certain territories had their guys. You know, it was Paul Bosch in Texas. It was, you know, Lance Russell in Memphis. And it was Roger Kent in the AWA. And uh, definitely a legend. And uh, he'll, be, he'll be missed. You know, it's one guy after another. I, you know, I, I can't impress upon you guys enough, especially these old school guys like me. You know, we go to Cauliflower Alley Club in Vegas every year. And one after another, year after year after year, we're losing somebody. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's pretty sad. You know, the old timers are dying off and, you know, there's a new breed coming in and it's just part of life. And, uh, but yeah, Roger was, uh, he was a real character and, and definitely a broadcasting icon in Minnesota. Yeah, absolutely. Sad, sad news, obviously, and it kind of came as a shock to, to, I know, to you and to me when I read it through Mean Gene. Actually, that's how I found out about it. But uh, unfortunate circumstances, I know he was a legend in his own right. Um, you know, kind of moving on from that here, we have, you know, your people listening to this podcast might think, you know, what, what's Mick do now these days? Well, Mick, Mick is the pencil for Steel Domain Wrestling. So <laughs> they, have, they have a big show coming up on Saturday, December 13th at 7 p.m. at the American Legion in Richfield, Minnesota. The card's going to be great. I mean, it's, it's championship wrestling from the Twin Cities brought to you by, obviously, Steel Domain Wrestling, CW Twin Cities. Uh, you know, we got Hotshot Danny Dugan from Canada. We obviously got Ari Davari, Craven Knight, Ricky Love, who's a, a hot upstart out of Iowa. Do you want to kind of give us a little plug for that show? And is that the show where Danny's doing a camp for people who've never been in the wrestling ring as well? Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I want to go back to that pencil thing. I want to remind you of something. I may be the steel domain pencil, but as you know very well, Lenny, um, Ed Hellier is the eraser. So, you know, there's the He's pencil. He's the eraser in the, pay, the paycheck or the, the, the checkbook. So well, yeah, yeah <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, somewhere along those lines. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a great show. And Danny is going to be doing this fantasy camp. And I, I wasn't even aware of it. All of a sudden, I go to the Steel Domain Wrestling page. There it is. Uh, so I would urge people to go to SteelDomainWrestling.com and uh, read about that. Uh, Danny is another great guy. It's again, it's kind of a turnover in talent because now we got guys coming in from Canada and Iowa working with Steel Domain. Uh, but this is a great show, and we tape it for the internet. The the name Championship Wrestling from the Twin Cities actually evolved from a uh, guy, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, David Marquez, who's worked extensively with Adam Pierce. He is kind of trying to get a coalition of uh, promoters and towns together out of the Championship Wrestling from such and such banner. And uh, so we're doing that. We're taping it for the Internet, and it's a holiday show for kids. Uh, American uh, kids have, have special prices. We're going to be giving out some free pictures of the National Wrestling Stars, and, and there's an after party right there at the Legion. And you would have been on that show, my friend, yeah, had I you know. decided you know, not to uh, exit stage left. You would certainly have been on that show. 
just so you uh, know. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of those things that uh, my boots are still in the closet, man. There's not much dust on them, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But obviously, uh, if you guys also want to go to that show, you're going to see the man who basically made Brock Lesnar who he is today, Mitch Paradise. So that's cool. And tickets are only $12. SteelDomainWrestling.com. You can follow Steel Domain Wrestling on Twitter. They're at official SDW. Mick, man, we covered a lot of ground tonight. We went longer than we wanted to, but you know, I'm not cutting you off. You're a brilliant mind in pro wrestling. You're, you're, Thank you. you know, walk down, uh, you know, the wrestling history, and I'm a big advocate for wrestling history. We had Carmine on here, and, and with you on here, I really think our listening audience is going to really appreciate some of the stuff that you guys have. And um, you know, I, I hope we can do this again because I'd love to get you back on and maybe talk, you know, some more new age wrestling because I know you're frustrated with some of the stuff uh, on. TV nowadays, and, and we can save that for another time down the road. Maybe maybe things will take a turn for the better. Maybe you'll uh, put a smile on your face when you watch Monday Night Raw every Monday. No, no, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate the opportunity, guys, and and I know yeah, it is a trip down memory lane when the when we're talking the AWA and all that stuff. But uh, it's a pleasure, and I got to say for you, uh, Brian, uh, and again, not just because you're you're co-hosting this show. You were a hell of a talent, and I told you that way back when. And uh, you know, I know you got a shoot job and a shoot career right now. And uh, but you you had it going, man. And uh, the sky would have been the limit for you. And you certainly have a home in Steel Domain if you ever decide to dust off those boots. Uh, we'll be more than happy to have you on board. Mick, right. Mick, don't steal them away from me, man. <laughs> I uh, I definitely appreciate that. Now you know I'm 27 years old, so uh, the time away from the ring has been nice, but. You never know, right? Never say never is the uh, infamous wrestling, uh, I guess, line that people like to use. That's right. You got it. And as far as, you know, I'm not going to get into a bidding war with you. Uh, I mean, as far as, you know, <laughs> for, for Ryan's services, don't worry about it. If you want it, you got it. You're sitting on stacks yeah. of cash, yeah. man. You're sitting on stacks of cash. All I can buy. Looks like I'm gonna get one of those. I'm gonna get one of those AWA paydays if I come back. So uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, or steal though, mate. It's all the same. Yeah, whatever. You know. I mean, and as far as Mick, if you guys want to look up Mick online, he's uh, you know he's got an official fan page. It's Slick Mick Wrestling fan page. You look it up on Facebook. He's on there, and he kind of keeps you guys up to date with things as well. So Mick, thanks a lot, man. Take care. Uh, good luck with the show on the 13th with Steel Domain. I know you guys are gonna do fantastic. Thank you guys, and I appreciate the opportunity. All right, man. You take care. All right. Sounds good. All right. Bye-bye. You're listening to The Pencil, the professional wrestling podcast featuring me, the one and only Ready D, every Tuesday on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and YouTube. Find us online at PencilPodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at Pencil Podcast.